God, it's sign of our times, coronavirus. This is Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. It's the one o'clock block, uh, block with Mike DeWert. And we're talking to our chief scientist here um, about uh, herd immunity, an update on herd immunity and vaccines. It's getting complicated and it needs to be clarified. We, we uh, saw a very interesting segment by uh, Rachel Maddow on uh, MSNBC last week. Um, which uh, made her analysis of how things would work in Donald Trump's um, attempts to do herd. He called it herd mentality. He really meant herd immunity. I'm not sure he knows what he's talking I am sure he doesn't know what he's talking about. Um, but let's examine herd immunity, Mike, and see what you have found in your scientific analysis of it. I'm so excited about this show because it clarifies uh, perhaps confusion that we have seen. Yeah, so um, we talked about herd immunity before, months ago, when we talked about what it would take to achieve herd immunity in Hawaii. Uh, you only, the consensus is that you need 60 to 80 percent of the population to have the infection and get over it to achieve herd immunity by infection. In Hawaii, that of a 1.4 million population, means about a million people got to get the disease. And that's a, that's a lot of sick people. Um, in the current state, as of today, about 1% of the people in Hawaii that catch the disease die. So that's uh, 10,000 dead people, almost a year's worth of casualties from, you know, from all other causes put together uh, that we're talking about. So it's, it's herd immunity is, I don't know, the first slide shows what I think of this uh, in terms of... Um, it just shows a cartoon of, you know, Greenberg uh, says, you know, back in 1776, we were willing to fight the common enemy, the British. Now a lot of people are collaborating with the common enemy, the COVID. Uh, I don't really uh, understand all of the sociology of it, which is much harder than physics, but that's where we are. There's people who don't want to fight the common enemy. They want us to let the reaper take his toll and have 10,000 of our fellow citizens in Hawaii die. And, you know, the United States as a whole has two, 300 million people, so about 200 million people have to get the disease. Uh, and 1% of 200 million is uh, 2 million, which is dying. There'll be more than that, wouldn't it? I mean, uh, what, what Rachel Maddow said was that 2.97 is the, yeah. the average death rate, and that would be, um, uh, gee, at, at 200, uh, that would be 6 million people die. Yeah, yeah, I'm hoping that uh, we, like Hawaii have got our death rate down to about where it is in New Zealand, about 1%. I'm hoping that the United States as a whole could do as well. The problem is that um, that we will overwhelm the healthcare system if we try to achieve herd immunity too quickly um, through the infection. And then there's the question of whether your immunity lasts. Like we showed on August 24th with a simulation of the COVID, uh, of a pandemic spread, that if the herd immunity, if your immunity to the disease only lasts a few months, then we'll be subject to repeated waves of infection every couple of years. And every wave will get worse because people will be weakened from the previous wave. So we can look at the reaper taken as one to 3% toll every two years. And if, if our immunity from infection is not permanent. So we, no matter what, we really need a vaccine and we need to be patient and go for it. Um, let's see what the next slide say. So the next slide, I uh, well, I just talk about you know this dangerous illusion of herd immunity. So like I talked about um, uh, more as many people could die from the healthcare system collapsing as from the disease itself. And we'll go into what that what what healthcare collapse in Hawaii would take. Um, and there. My guess is that most of the people who are advocating for herd immunity by infection have a delusion of insulating privilege. They think they're not going to get it because they're too rich, they got too many doctors around them, or because they're young and not sick, like, a, like tennis player Novak Djokovic, who tried to organize a tournament in Serbia and then ended up getting COVID-19 himself and passing it on to some of his family members. So, And we're finding lately that even young people um, who get the disease can have a weakened cardiovascular system, putting them at risk when they engage in sports of dying or being extremely sick. 
Um, they can show no symptoms, no classical symptoms of the COVID. They can be over them and yet still not have their heart and current vascular system healed enough to deal with strenuous sports. So non-fatal cases, you still got to watch people make them stay off the field, stay out of the games until you're really sure that they're over it. Yeah. Uh, so, and you know, I just, this, I find this whole discussion of herd immunity offensive because human beings are not cattle. We're not fungible herd animals. You know, the person that you so blithely throw away could have been the professor of medicine that would have taught the surgeon that would have saved your life. And now you're gonna die because that surgeon didn't learn the critical thing. Or they could have been the wily fire captain who knows exactly where the plate is gonna go next who would have saved your home. Well, now he's not there to use his experience or she's not there to use her experience to help you. So this, this is just a concept we really should not even allow into our I find I find it really remarkable and ironic that um, uh, Trump would um, Trump would support herd immunity or even suggest it when at the same time um, he would strike uh, Roe v. Wade. Um, so we we have uh, all these um, people dying, but all these fetuses living uh, in families that may be dysfunctional because they're impoverished. Well, uh, you know, we we could have another Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Right. succumb uh, to COVID in a herd immunity analysis. Yeah, I mean, it, these are, of course, separate issues. The issue of Roe v. Wade versus uh, herd, how we treat this pandemic. Although it does look like uh, uh, the respect for life uh, is very strong until that life is actually in the world. Then it's on its own. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, uh, but uh, you know, one, one thing that you said, I'd like to just dwell on for a minute. And that is um, that if, when you have, when you want and get herd immunity by not doing anything, um, then the healthcare system is likely to collapse. Yeah. And I think you touched this point that if the healthcare system collapses, uh, people die not only from COVID, they die from a lot of other things that the healthcare system cannot help them with. Mm-hmm. So you get all kinds of fatalities from non-COVID causes. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's, it's, that's worse than a million or two or six million, whatever you calculate out, because the healthcare system can't save people. Yeah. Yeah. So on the next page, we go through some updated numbers for just Hawaii. Um, so we, like I say, we'd need about a million people to get it's sick, and that's a pretty conservative number. That's sixty percent instead of eighty percent of our one point four million Hawaii residents, uh, with a one percent fatality rate, which is what it was as of this morning. That would be ten thousand people dead, um, hospitalized. About six and a half percent of COVID cases in Hawaii that happen to be hospitalized, and um, on average, you're in for eleven days. So that's seven hundred twenty thousand bed, seven hundred twelve thousand bed days. We got about maybe eight hundred beds we could put towards COVID patients. So that means we could we have to spread this million cases over about nine hundred days. We could tolerate eleven, and even then we still talk about eleven hundred cases a day, which is like three times anything we've had before in Hawaii. Oh. Uh, and it, so even if we get impatient for a vaccine we still are gonna deal with this for at least three years unless we're willing to completely collapse the healthcare system. And that's a, and, and we fill up the hospital with COVID patients and there's like other patients that aren't gonna get help. You know, transplant patients might, waiting lists will get longer. Doctors will start getting sick. Nurses, well, they're already getting sick. Nurses, doctors, hospital staff, um, anybody that comes in contact with the patients is at risk and is putting other people at risk. And so this, if you're impatient for a vaccine, well, it's, your impatience isn't going to be rewarded. Um, yeah. Your, <clears throat> well, one thing, just a footnote to all of this, is that while you have these millions of people, and in the state of Hawaii, an extraordinary number of people dying from a herd immunity um, initiative, um, the economy is really bad. 
the economy goes to zero effect effectively because uh, it's a it's um, you know people can't function and b they're scared. Um, so I think uh, you know to the extent we worry about the economy now, uh, in in Trump's world of herd immunity, it would be it would be much worse. Yeah, if we were if we were having eleven hundred cases a day of the COVID nineteen in Hawaii, which is kind of the number you're talking about to achieve herd immunity by infection, you'll see people way scared to go out and, and even do the, go to the grocery store. You'll see people reluctant to take jobs to grocery delivery. I mean, you might not be able to get your Uber Eats, you know, for, for the carry out for the order. Um, the, the, we need to really pull together, wear our masks, wash our hands, do our social distancing, do everything we can to slow the spread of this disease so we don't get the infection rates up to 1,100 a day. And if we need to keep avoiding dangerous activities like going to bars, having big sporting events and stadiums, we need to do that. You know, the Great Depression was a horrible four years for the United States of America, but we got through it. And fewer people died in the Great Depression than died during the boom afterwards per year. Mm. So, um, <clears throat> Well, what, what about the, you know, can, uh, can some kind of uh, herd immunity initiative coexist logically with uh, rolling out a vaccine? With, with what? With having a vaccine? With, yeah, having a vaccine. Sure. I mean, well, the vaccine is the best way to achieve herd immunity. If you achieve herd immunity by vaccinating 60 to 80 percent of the population, then you've achieved herd immunity without killing people. And if so, and in the meantime, you still have to manage the infection because a vaccine isn't going to, even if tomorrow they announce our phase three clinical trial is a success. This is 100% effective vaccine. Now we've got to roll it out. Well, you've got to roll out doses for 300 million people. Um, and even with the flu, where you, that's the kind of numbers we're talking about, the annual flu vaccine, that takes a whole year to ramp up to make those doses with the current technology. Um, so we're still talking about having to do your social distancing for a year. Even once, even once the vaccine is out, because we're not going to have it right away. Yeah, and you said uh, 300, 300 million um, people would have to get the vaccine, but that, that's only in this country. Yes. Um, and it, that assumes that we, we, we have, we're in sort of international lockdown. Yeah. Um, because if we, if we open the board, if we think that that's going to enable us to open the borders wrong again, uh, because you, you have then you have to deal on a global basis and you need a lot more than 300 million uh, vaccine inoculations. Yeah, and some of these vaccines that are in development take two doses spread some months apart to be fully effective. So your 300 million United States becomes 600 million. For the world, it becomes it goes from 7 billion to 14 billion doses to be produced. And yeah. some of the vaccines... Uh, they need to be refrigerated. They need to be frozen. Um, they may not be suitable for the third, or for, even for rural America. You know, you go out into some of the more remote places. It might be hard to get the proper, you know, refrigeration or cooling to get those doses out there. And people who are poor may not be able to travel twice to get a vaccine to a big city. You know, so we we do have a problem. Even if we had the vaccine right away, like tomorrow. We still have years before we can vaccinate everyone. And as you pointed out, if everybody in the world isn't safe, nobody in the world is safe. Yeah. Especially if well, immunity lapsed. Well, the, the other thing that uh, strikes me is that, um, you know, I, I don't feel that the public knows exactly what the state of uh, vaccine development is okay we know you have to get through a phase three trial although the chinese seem to have skipped that in their efforts at a vaccine which may be more successful than we think i mean i don't i don't know if there's a, that much news about the chinese efforts at vaccine they we know they, they they're working on one or they actually are using it um but what strikes me is you got moderna you got yeah. um what's the other one um well you have novartis you have novartis. Johnson. 
Um, AstraZeneca. I mean, so three at least to come to mind, and I'm sure there's more out there if you started Googling this. Uh, so are they all the same, Mike? You no, know, they're not all the same. I mean, like the Sputnik V has got a vector based upon a common cold virus, common adenovirus to deliver a, a immunity to coronavirus to your system, but it takes two doses of Sputnik V to actually achieve what they claim they're achieving. And it's not even clear that the Russian Sputnik V is actually working as well. Um, the preliminary data they provided, there are 76 patients in this preliminary trial. Some of the, uh, apparently according to some of the reviewers, some of the patients data is suspiciously similar. They just copied one column of a spreadsheet to another column of a spreadsheet. <laughs> so they're asking for more data from the Russians. But the Russians now claim to be in a phase three trial of about 40,000 people. Uh, I hope it works. You know, I mean, we don't want people being harmed by a, a bad vaccine or people thinking they've been immunized or they haven't been going on cavalierly catching the disease. Uh, but in the United States, there's three vaccines that are in phase three trials now. Um, there's, of course, the Moderna one, uh, AstraZeneca. Um, they had to pause their trial because a couple of patients developed neurological symptoms. I haven't read enough to know whether those symptoms were related to the vaccine or not. Um, they've resumed their trial, so apparently they're, they're satisfied that the risk is low enough that they can safely continue the trial. Um, Moderna, then there's uh, Pfizer and BioNTech, they have a vaccine. Uh, that vaccine takes two doses. Um, the AstraZeneca vaccine takes two doses. Um, let's see if there's what's Moderna's. Moderna's takes two doses. So we've got it. The three vaccines that are leading contenders to be out soon is because they're phase two trial of it, all require two doses. And um, AstraZeneca, of course, is based in Britain. So they're going to be under pressure not to provide just the United States first. They're going to have to ramp up production for Britain and Europe, as well as the United States. And ethically, you should make it available to everyone in the world. Wow. The Russians have partnered with Reddy's lab in India to make hundreds of millions of doses for, in, you know, in a generic facility, Dr. Reddy's labs. So there's at least some people trying to make an effort to be ethical about how this vaccine is used and distributed. Anything from Germany? I, rem I remember Trump was trying to buy the German um, technology, German research on this, and they said no. Um, but they seem to be advanced enough to, uh, you know, attract his interest. Yeah. Is this, are you talking about the Sanofi vaccine? Uh, I can't remember if Sanofi is a term. Could be. This is, this is where he, he tried to um, buy the, the research, buy the scientists, buy the company, and he was offering a billion dollars. I don't know if that was your money or mine. Um, but uh, but uh, it, it failed because they said, no, you can't buy us. Good yeah. Time. Yeah, there's, um, yeah there, there's been a whole bunch of these claims of medications or vaccines that uh, could be effective. I, I don't know I don't with the German one. You know, one of the other things that's popped up here uh, is uh, an article I saw about um, espionage. Um, that there's a fair amount of espionage going on in the world where each, um, each country, it's nice to know we're all into isolationist mode uh, and the collaboration you would have hoped in the case of a global pandemic uh, is not complete. Uh, and in fact, um, some countries are doing active espionage to find out the progress of other countries and companies. Um, this article suggested that Russia was doing that because that's what Russia Russia does. It does espionage. And China, for that matter, was also doing And for that matter, the U.S. was doing it. Um, how does that enter into the process of uh, trying to find, um, you know, at least um, a few workable vaccine solutions? Yeah, I think the doctors and scientists generally want to genuinely want to solve the problem and help as many people as possible. The nationalism does get in the way because it makes it hard for you to uh, learn from people in other countries who may have stumbled upon something important and useful. I mean, this would be like fighting space aliens. And if the Russians say, oh, we've got the weapon that will kill the space aliens, we're going to let everybody else have it. 
Well, the Americans did that, or the Europeans did that. <laughs> the aliens would invade and take over the rest of the world. You'd be surrounded. <laughs> You know, um, there's, there's also a question of skepticism, and, and I think that comes from a number of places. Well, I mean, uh, for me, I'm skeptical of anything that Trump says. I don't believe anything he says. And I'm usually validated in my skepticism because what he says isn't true, um, such as his analysis overheard mentality. Um, but, you know, uh, th that feeds through the community. And then, of course, there are people who are anti-vaxxers anyway, and they're skeptical of any drug and certainly any vaccine, especially with they're all experimental and nobody can, you know, can really point to a, a long time successful experience. So what you have is you have a, a distrust of him, distrust of administration. We know that the CDC has lost uh, the trust of the public. NIH has lost the trust of the public. The FDA has lost the trust, trust of the public. Uh, HHS has lost the, the trust of the public. Um, that affects people's willingness to get on board and take a vaccine, especially when it's going to be brand new and rolled out in large numbers, ideally into large numbers of people. So the expectation is that some 50 percent of, of people will say no. Now that affects the the you know, what do you call it the pandemic effect of the vaccine, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. And I guess it's thank goodness for Dr. Fauci. At least he seems to maintain some trust and uh, integrity through this mess. Um, if people maybe, don't take it, Mike, it, it's I mean, not, if people don't take it, it's not going to be effective well, on, on an epidemiological level, right? I got to say, given the the um, rush that Trump is putting on. And I don't want to bash Trump. I mean, the scientists are going to do everything they can to make sure that the trials adhere to scientific integrity and are well run. And we have seen the CDC give advice and then retract advice that was inconvenient for administration, you know, like the recent retraction of their guidance that aerosols could spread the COVID so you really need to mask up. Now they say, no, 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 you got to be a summary for an extended period. Well, the science is kind of leading towards, yeah, aerosols might be a problem. And you take precautions as if they were, it was aerosolized. And the same thing with the vaccine. You know, I, I, I'm going to read the reports, the peer reviewed reports on the vaccine before I take it. Um, that's, having said that, it's, um, most people won't be able to do that evaluation. And so we somehow need to bring back the trust uh, in, in, in expertise. And we've got administrations done everything they can to erode trust in science, unfortunately. Um, perhaps the only thing that will bring back the trust is if uh, people start getting vaccin vaccinated and the vaccine vaccinated people stop dying and the unvaccinated people keep dying. I hate to say it that way. But then maybe they'll wake up and say, yes, we need to get vaccinated. Yeah, yeah, they're going to wait to, to, to see what happens. And I think I, I would I would wait to see what happens. It's like buying a new piece of uh, electronic gear. You don't want to be the first online. You want to make sure it works. Give it a little experience. Uh, no need to make yourself a guinea pig. I mean, that would be the analysis. But, what, you know, we had a show earlier today, Mike. Not a guinea pig. Well, I mean, if I, if I don't know if it works... Um, you know, I'm going to be less enthusiastic about taking it. And if I keep hearing all this stuff about warp speed, I'm going to be less enthusiastic about taking it. And I do believe that uh, Trump does have uh, an extraordinary effect on the honesty of people around him, uh, including government agencies and, for that matter, companies. So I'm, I'm, just, I'm just skeptical. But, but you know, the, we had one show earlier today um, where, uh, you know, the, these guys were talking about um, air, 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 air cleaners, air, air so, purif purifiers, purifiers, <clears throat> where with or without a uh, ultraviolet, um, you know, component, uh, they, were, they were able to screen out um, uh, objects, of, uh, you know, microscopic objects of point, 0.03 microns, which is pretty small, 
And that means they could probably screen out viral particles. Uh, a viral particle with the lipid oil shell is bigger than a viral particle without the shell, of course. And, and 0.3 microns would cover a lot of these um, COVID particles. So theoretically, an air purifier would be able to screen this out. And if theoretically, if we have, um, um, you know, aerosol spread and you put a, a, an adequate uh, air, air, uh, uh, air cleaner okay. yeah, in, in the room, you can screen out particles. Maybe you can't get them all, but could certainly reduce the number of particles and maybe reducing the number of particles reduces the risk for people in the room. Um, so that's one layer. See, his theory was layering. You have that, you have masks, you have social distancing, and so on and so forth. Uh, even without a vaccine, you reduce the risk to each individual um, by having all these layers. Do you agree? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I'm not sure about the efficacy of air, air purifiers, so you, you know, but they could hurt. Um, you just have to make sure about the maintenance and cleanliness of it. But yeah, you, you want to be proactive. Wash your hands, wear your mask. I wear, every time I'm in a grocery store, I wear not just a mask, but a face shield because mm -hmm. uh, that's an extra layer of protection for me. Face shield doesn't do anything to protect other people. But, um, and outdoors is way safer than indoors. I mean, if you want to take a walk with a friend, it's better to do it in the park than to do it in the mall, for example. Yeah, yeah. Well, one thing that came up a few days ago, I'd like to post to you and see if you have a reaction. As a doctor, and this is not a scientific study, but there was a doctor that did a study of something in the order of 200,000 people um, on their level of vitamin D, which is the sunshine vitamin. And uh, he found it was associated with some medical school in, in uh, Massachusetts. Um, and he found that um, if you had a, a, a sub a, a sub recommended, a, you know, below standard level of vitamin D in your body, you were likely more likely to get COVID. Uh, if you had, you know, uh, an adequate amount of vitamin D in your body, you were less likely. And he had some data on that. I don't. I, I doubt it would meet scientific rigor, but uh, it did suggest that. Uh, and, and this is consistent with going out for a walk, although that's a ventilation question also. Um, but it did suggest that if you had plenty of vitamin D, you'd be better off. You have any thoughts? A lot of claims have made for vitamin D. I even saw one doctor who claimed that if you got enough sunshine, you would never get cancer because of the vitamin D. So that, that's overblown. So a lot of claims are for over, overblown claims for vitamin D. I think it can't hurt you to take your vitamin D, make sure you don't have an actual deficiency, a modest amount of sunlight. Um, vitamin D has been shown to reduce respiratory infections. You know, if you can get up to a normal amount instead of having a deficiency. So it can't hurt. Uh, I'd have to read more of the science to know whether it really, really helps. Yeah. Well, taking all those things in, into consideration, I mean, the national efforts or lack, uh, the fact, the work on the vaccine, um, you know, the, I don't know, I, I, I don't think our herd immunity is worth a damn, but that's just me. Uh, or maybe you too. <laughs> and Sweden, all of Sweden would have to go along with us on that. But all these, all these factors we've been talking about, how does that inform policy in a state where we really can't control, you know, we can't control our, our, our commerce, so to speak, with other places. There's always going to be comings and goings, even if it's minimal, there's still comings and goings. How does that inform our policy? You know, is there anything that we could do, should do as a state, um, uh, you know, given these factors to minimize the loss of life? Testing and contact tracing. You need to be able to track down the people who have been exposed. You need to test people who have been exposed who aren't just showing symptoms. And uh, now we can control the spread and maybe reopen a few things. Um, but if we really want to achieve herd immunity by infection, we get up to 1,000 cases a day. Can you imagine the firestorm? If we had 1,000 cases a day of COVID-19, you know, 10 deaths every day. Um, We'd be a wreck. Yeah. And we need a better way to, we need some better analytics, some better 
model in to predict which businesses are most risky, which businesses are most, less risky to actually open. Because we do want to open the economy, we just want to do it in a smart way based on science. Well, there may be people who come up with things, not necessarily a vaccine, because that's certainly the expensive route, but ways to minimize the risk, to layer the protections and so forth. And as you say, testing, you know, uh, um, uh, we have uh, Oceanit was in the paper, uh, which we had a show with Oceanit several weeks ago about this, with their spit in a cup test, which is cheap and immediate uh, to find out if you have it. And, and although, you know, the comparative uh, accuracy of that test may not be the same as the nostril test. Um, if you take it every day, this is what the analysis was, then you can achieve accuracy because it, even if it's off on one day, over a period of days, it's likely to be just as accurate or more um, than, you know, the traditional, you know, nostril test. But I think all these things we have to pay attention to. And I guess if I were to answer that question myself, I would say, yes, but we have to do what we say is right. We have to find ways to do what is right. And, you know, there was a piece also about the 44,000, now 55,000 tickets that HPD has, has given out to people, uh, which demonstrates that people are not following the rules. <laughs> I mean, what, what, what is on their minds? Do they not take this seriously? I have to put at least some of that on Trump's door. Um, but the reality is that we, if we wanted to know these things and inform our own policy, the very first thing we would do is follow the same rules uh, that we all know are the rules from six months ago. Yeah, and turn off Twitter and Facebook. Don't get your information from them. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mike. It's always great to talk to you. I, I, I would like to continue this discussion because there'll be so many things that cross, cross our bow in the next few weeks. And we should, we should uh, evaluate them in light of what we know and what, and what science tells us. Thank you, Mike DeWert, Chief Scientist of Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha.